Hi, I'm Zach Childs and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Our next guest began his professional career as a teenager in rural Texas. He was playing with a then unknown songwriter by the name of Chris Tomlin. Fast forwarding 18 years, Daniel Carson continues to play with Chris Tomlin and Chris Tomlin has had great success. He's sold millions of albums and just surpassed the 1.8 billion streams on Pandora. So today's guest is Daniel Carson. Hello. <laughs> yes. He's been, been with uh, Chris Tomlin since the beginning. Has, yeah. Has toured with him, has uh, co-written some, uh, played in the studio, toured with him. Thanks for uh, for being on the show, and thanks for us. Uh, thanks for letting us, uh, you know, invade your home. Oh man, are you kidding? This is amazing. First of all, uh, thank you for being here. This is like, yeah. uh, or for asking me to be on the sh on the show. Where it's, uh, I, I'm a fan for starters. I watch these shows, and I've even we've talked about it several times. Be like, man, I love this one episode you did with so and so. You know, like so I I keep up with it, and I'm inspired by it, and so it's 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 cool to have you here, man. Thank you. You're very welcome. Man. And we, I kind of cleaned up the place as a result of you coming over to film. All right. <laughs> very good like, I always life. joke, and we joke in our marriage, like my wife and I were like, hey, we should invite some people over. That way we'll like redo that bathroom. Absolutely. <laughs> it's <laughs> like you get inspired to like touch things up when you're going to have a party or something. We're so it's do like, a little dusting it's around. It's like, yeah, we should film something in my studio. Maybe I'll buy a rug, you know. Yeah. So good so to have you. Thank you. How did you start playing the guitar? Uh, so my dad is a guitar player. Yeah. Uh, he was in ministry my whole life, um, still is. He was a youth pastor, um, but he was also a musician. So he would like, um, you know, he grew up playing. It's kind of that classic baby boomer story of like, um, you know, saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. You know, that, so, you know it's like he loved uh, old rock music. And um, so I grew up around all that. You know, he, yeah. he, even though he was a youth pastor and we had lots of Christian music in the home and hymns and um, worship music. Um, he also had a steady diet of like, you know, uh, the Eagles and the Doobie Brothers and, you know, James Taylor and the Beatles and all that stuff. So it was like I was getting some of both, you know. Yeah. And um, so I started playing guitar, um, really started playing drums first because okay. my dad was a guitar player and I really loved drums. I don't know if it's like a young male thing. I just want to like hit something or yeah. I just thought it was cool, you know. And to, to his credit, to my parents' credit, they always were really, really big believers in like, our, our dreams as kids and so I told him I wanted to play drums and so he went and bought a drum kit like a nice pearl export kit and I don't think it was like used it was like it was sensible it's not yeah. like uh, we, weren't, we weren't spoiled by any means he was a youth pastor but it was like it was like he believed like hey I think he's got the itch you know you like telling my wife like I think mm -hmm. you know I think I think he's really going to be into this music thing so he gave me they bought me a drum kit because I really was showing some like interest and uh and he bought me a kit, drum kit and he said, hey, we're playing in two weeks at church. Like, you need to practice. Yeah. I was like, two weeks? Yeah. You know, so get, I just, yeah, get, get ready. ready. Yeah, <laughs> trial by fire. So I'm thrown into the mix, you know. And so I'll fast forward quickly. But basically, I started playing drums a lot with him, traveling and doing camps and playing at church. And literally, every time the doors of the, op doors of the church were open, I was playing something. Yeah. And I started playing percussion. I started playing this and that. And then I started realizing my friends would come over and be like, man, that's so cool you play drums. Play me a song. And I'd be like, wow. Well, I just know beats. I don't know. I don't know how to play a song. Yeah. And so I think that's what really drove me to guitar was like the melody, you know, the sense of like a tune and a sound. And, you know, it's like how many times can you play Wipeout for your buddy on drums before, <laughs> before they're like bored out of their mind? <laughs> and so like, so I asked my dad, I was like, can you teach me how to play guitar? And he was a, he was a good guitar player. And he's like, yeah, sure. So, you know, one summer we sat down and he showed me like basic chords and stuff and kind of went from there. I kind of just became obsessed with it. And then it's like drums didn't even matter to me anymore. I was just obsessed with the guitar. It's all I thought about in school. It's all I would, you know, sit in class and like draw tabs on my <laughs> on my binder of my book, you know, just like, it's all I thought about was guitar. I was obsessed with it. And um, so that's kind of where it started. Thankfully I had a m music family, you know, he, my dad was musical and my mom's side was all musical. And so it was like coming from both sides. Everyone was, it was a very musical family. Everyone sang, everyone played. It was just kind of one of those things. And yeah. Um, and it was all church music, uh, mostly, um, as far as like what they did anytime they sang out somewhere, you know, it was always at church. And so, um, yeah, so I just, I played in my youth group, I played at camps, I played with my dad. So I had gotten like, before I even um, met Chris and started playing with them on the road, I had already played, you know, semi-professionally for like five or six years yeah. touring with my dad, you know? So. Yeah. What were some of the songs that you were playing at this point? What era was this? Um, 
before the nineties, mid nineties. It would have been like okay. kind of the. Um, I'm just trying to think. It would have been like uh, the Lord, I lift your name on highs, yeah. and uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of songs that would be like that everyone would know. But was, you know, my dad was a writer too, so he wrote some songs that we played and toured yeah. with. And then um, I was really inspired by um, a band called Delirious. Yeah, and uh, so they, they kind of yeah, Stu G, yeah. yeah, and uh, Matt Redman and Chris Tomlin actually, because he yeah. he was leading worship at a, the youth camp that my church went to, not just the camps that I was playing with my dad. So Chris, Delirious, and, and Matt Redman probably, that was that batch of songs. It was like yeah. The Heart of Worship, and um, Chris, song, Chris had a song called Forever, and some, was like, there's a handful of these, like uh, We Fall Down, I think was one that Chris wrote that was an early song, and we were, we were playing all these in my church and touring with yeah. them and stuff, and so, yeah, it just kind of was in my, I guess in my DNA at that point. Besides Stu G, what were, would be some of the other guitar players that had influenced you? He was a big one. You know, honestly, yeah. because I don't know if it was because I grew up in church or just because my parents didn't listen to it, but I, I was influenced by Stu G before I was influenced by The Edge, even though okay. people might listen to uh, modern worship music or whatever, and be like, oh, it all sounds like, the, you know, the, yeah. it's influenced by The Edge, which eventually it probably was for me. But in the early days, it was more um, Stu G influenced. Yeah. And, uh, and then like 90s, uh, pop bands that I was, or rock bands that I was listening to, but like, um, I'm trying to think of what another, I was really into the band Toad the Wet Sprocket. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. They had this killer guitar player. Uh, I think his name was Todd Nichols, but he was, he, I loved, he had a, like the matchless thing going. It was the first time I'd heard that sound, you know, this like cranked matchless thing. And I was like, man, what is this sound? I love this electric guitar tone. Yeah. So I became really into that band. And then it was like old stuff. I loved old sounding guitars and licks and stuff like the Eagles and all that stuff. So it was probably like a combination of like Eagles, Pearl Jam, Toad the Wet Sprocket, and Stoogie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a fun combination. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what probably where... And James Taylor. I really loved acoustic guitar. So that, it was yeah. a lot of that. So how did you meet Chris? So he was the worship leader at the youth camp I grew up going to. So um, we met at a church in Dallas and uh, he was really young and he had just started. So he like had like I remember he came and did a thing at our church one time, and he had just um, a mini disc player and his acoustic. That was his band, you know. <laughs> so and he would have the mini disc going, and he'd play along with <laughs> yes, it. So that was his tracks. Yeah. yeah. So he'd hit play. Yeah. Or he had like a a volunteer go back there, and he'd like give him a nod, and yes. you know, start the next. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he kind of like started with just an acoustic traveling playing, and then he kind of over the years we would literally go to the same youth camp in Dallas every summer, and he was always the worship leader, and. Um, so his band kind of grew. The first year it was just him and maybe a drummer, you know, or or tracks or something. The next year it was like, oh, they got a bass player and a keyboard player. And the next year it was like, oh, they got an electric guitar player. And, yeah. Um, oh, that's another one I should mention. There was a guy named Jack Parker who played um, guitar in Chris's band before I did. Okay. And he also played for a band called uh, David Crowder Band. Okay. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with David Crowder. Yeah. Which is actually a funny story. Crowder is from my town in Texas, and he was in my dad's youth group. So my dad was his youth pastor, and they traveled and toured together. Crowder played keys in my dad's band. Wow. This was ages ago, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, he's, he's like maybe 10 years older than me. But um, So, yeah, I grew up around Crowder, and he and this guy named Jack uh, started playing guitar together at Baylor. So Jack was Chris's first guitarist, okay. and I would go bug him at youth camp, like, man, what's that pedal, and what does that do? What is it? I just, you know, just dying to know what yeah. makes these sounds. How did you play that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you know, you get like, that? Yeah. you hear these sounds, you don't know where they're coming from, and you're just yeah. dying to know what it was. And I remember he had, like, a couple of rack units that I thought were super cool, and he had, like, a coral flange pedal or something, you know, some, like, yeah. some sort of modulation pedal that I had never, you know, I didn't even know existed, and I was like, oh. What are these sounds? You know? And he'd hit it at some point, and you'd be like, Whoa. Yeah, the heavens opened blow, up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> blow your mind. What was that? And sound? he was really great at like, um, he kind of really taught me the atmosphere thing. Like he yeah. would create these like beds of sounds and swells and stuff. And that that really shaped me as a guitar player because it wasn't like listening to a traditional rock or blues record, which is obviously foundational for a lot of guitar players. Yeah. But for what was applicable to my job in worship music was less about like blazing solos and more about like the tone and the atmosphere and kind of like yeah. creating these like little beds of sounds and stuff. And so I learned a lot of that from, from Jack, but, um, so yeah, I met Chris at my youth camp yeah. in Texas. 
So how did you end up playing in Chris Tomlin's band? <laughs> so, so t- how did this happen? Yeah. Uh, so, well, like I said, he was at my youth camp, and um, they needed a, a full-time guitarist. They couldn't, yeah. they couldn't get somebody who could do it full-time. And uh, my dad, like I said, was as uh, a youth pastor, and so he and Chris ran in some of the same circles in Texas. And so I think, you know, maybe my dad had kind of been like, "Hey, you need to hear my son play guitar," you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But that's every dad. Yeah. And so that didn't really necessarily fire Chris up, you know. He'd be like, "Okay, sure, I'm sure he's fine," you know. He's like 14. What do you want me to do about it, you know? Yeah. And I don't think Chris even thought that he was trying to wiggle me into the band I, I didn't even think that was an option I was just young and I wanted to play of course and I wanted to lead worship out of heart for like ministry I grew up in church and I really wanted to be a part of something like that but I just didn't know what that looked like and um, yeah so um, let's see it was right after so it was summer before my senior year and I think they just had an opening and they had seen me at camp a couple times and I don't think Chris had even heard me play and I think maybe one of the guys in the band was like hey Let's, what about Daniel? You know, like we see him at camp, you know, he's about to be available. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's going to graduate high school and then, you know, and, and, uh, and so Chris called my dad. I didn't have a phone, you know, this is back when you didn't have a, high schoolers didn't have phones. Yeah. And so yeah. he called my dad and was like, Hey, do you think Daniel could do some dates for us? We've got some dates coming up on the road. And my dad was like, Oh, I'm sure he would love that. But like, you've never even played with him or even heard him. Like, would you like for me to like drive him down and like we can like have a kind of semi tryout? Yeah. He's like, okay. So my dad and I packed up all of our stuff. Of course, when my dad told me, I was super, very excited. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I had no idea what it would become. I just was like, oh, this is a great opportunity. So we drove to Houston. Chris was living in Houston. Drove down to the Woodlands and um, set up in Chris's kitchen. So we had like maybe like one JBL Eon for Chris's vocal. Yeah. And he had his acoustic. We had a bass player who sat on like his little cab and drums and set up in the kitchen. And I had like, I think at the time I was playing like a, I had just bought my first like real amp. So I bought like a Buddha amp head, which is back here. It's like a little um, 18 watt head and my first couple of like good pedals, you know? So I was kind of getting into the boutique thing a little bit. I think I had, I taught a bunch of guitar lessons in high school and I think I bought my, I bought a Tom Anderson guitar. I was, which was a, that's a big deal for a high schooler. You know, that's that's really expensive. And I literally had, I was really, I taught and taught and taught guitar lessons and I would just give all the cash to my dad. Like, just hold this in like a drawer somewhere and then when I get enough, I'll order my favorite guitar, you know? So I like show up in the kitchen and I'm, you know, I think the first song we played was Open the Eyes of My Heart. I don't know if you remember the song yet. Yeah, yeah. And it was the first time that I played with the guys and they have been playing together a lot, touring for several years. And I was like, man, this feels amazing. Because they really were like a tight band, you know? And, um, the way Chris tells the story, he acts like this. It was like some sort of like shining moment where like <laughs> every, like the light hit me just right and everything sounded perfect. I don't remember it that way, but like and he was like, it was like Daniel was the chosen person for our band, but I, didn't, I was just more like nervous, you know? And uh, yeah, so that was kind of how it got started. Then Chris yeah. had to like pull my dad aside afterwards like, hey, I think we would like to have Daniel tour with us, but like I know you probably want him to go to college, right? You know? Yeah. And uh my dad was like, ah, oh, Daniel doesn't care about college. <laughs> he doesn't care. <laughs> Looking back, I thought, man, how supportive of my parents to just like let me skip that whole phase of life. And now I realize, now that I'm a dad, I'm like, they were probably so pumped that they didn't have to pay for college. <laughs> They're like, yeah, go tour, man. Take off, you know. Well, it, you, know, you know, there's, you know, there's, yeah, when you were already going into a career. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. teasing about the money thing. But yeah, yeah they were, they were, they were so supportive and it was really sweet. So I literally had to go beg my principal. Yeah. Because this was like August of my senior year and I had a full year. You know, I had to, like, yeah. some things to sort out, you know. And um, so I went to my principal and, he, and, and Chris, one of the main things he said was uh, a few months later, he called me and was like, hey, man, we've got this uh, opportunity to go on tour with Delirious, which was Stu G. That's right. my hero. And I'm right. like, I cannot believe this is happening. Yeah. This is like dream come true. I have to do this. Yeah. And I was just sweating and I was like, man, if I miss this, I'm going to be so mad, you know. So I'll go to my principal. I was, like, here's the thing, I'm going to have to miss a lot of school. It'll be like a whole month in the spring. And to his credit, God bless that man, he was like, you know, um, people miss school for football and volleyball and debate and all these other things. Like, you know, what, this is going to be your career, I can tell. Like, why, why wouldn't I let you do this? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe. Like, you know, it's like really yeah. an amazing, like, uh, not to over-spiritualize it, but I really felt like it was like a, 
kind of ordained a moment in my life where like there was a door opened, you know, and yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't know how I'm getting away with this, but I thank God he let me do yeah. this. Because you know? that, that would not be the response right. that you would think. Yeah, most no, would and have. I don't think you could even get away with it anymore. It was just like yeah. one of those, and he kind of basically was like, hey, you know, just don't tell me you're in, it's going to be fine, but yeah. don't make me look bad. Yeah. Like, don't fail. Yeah. <laughs> you need to graduate, yeah. and you're going to have to get an okay from all your teachers. So I had to go to each yeah. teacher and be like, I'll stay late. I'll do homework from the road. Yeah. I'll do whatever I got to do. And I had to make up all my hours. So I was in a couple of art classes. So literally every day after my, in my spring semester, I would stay after school for like three hours in my art class to make up all these hours. Yeah. Anyway, it was great. It, that's kind of how I got connected to Chris. So you're, you're touring with Chris Tomlin. And at this point, I mean, Chris Tomlin isn't that well known. So, right. so what are you touring in a van or how are you touring? Uh, he had a Suburban yeah. and trailer. Yeah. And uh, we loaded our you know gear in the back of the trailer and did lots of, super hot uh, Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas and whatever touring dates with the, with the uh, Suburban and trailer where you're unloading all that gear and setting it all up and everything. And yeah, um, yeah so we, that was kind of the, and then we, I think when we got a little bigger outfit, like maybe added a, a road manager or something, we got, he bought like a conversion van that was more comfortable to ride in. Yeah. That was like the next step, you know? Yeah. And then a few years later, we, uh, he eventually bought a bus uh, which was just life changing. Yeah. So, yeah, so all like, of a sudden oh. you can lay down. Oh and you yeah. Can sleep. And... Oh man, that was the best thing that ever happened when we uh, got the bus, and we we still tour in the same bus. That was I think he got it in 05. So we've had that bus for like 13 years. It's like a second home to all of us, you know. Yeah. So that first you know kind of big tour, you're uh, you're opening shows for Delirious, and uh, tell us about you know kind of all of a sudden being thrust into this other world and also you're kind of getting to open for one of your heroes and yeah yeah well i was nervous for sure and yeah. and i was a sponge i mean like yeah. all, i was so ready to learn you know i just was dying to know how you know every guitarist like gets that sound and how do you play that scale and how do you know what notes to play within that song and i was just so curious about all of it and um and so we went on that yeah that that first delirious tour was really eye opening it was the first time i ever played a uh, we didn't get to, I think we had to fly to the first state, so we had to have backline amps. Yeah. So they gave me, it was like an SIR AC30, you know, from the 90s. And I'm sure, I think it was probably the one with like, you know, the blue speakers, the one that I ended up falling in love with. And uh, and I played that amp and I was like, oh man, this is this is special. I, I love this. I didn't even know yeah. what I was getting into. I didn't even know what an AC30 was. You know, it was yeah. just like, this is amazing. And I saw that they were using them. And um, they were British and so they were playing like, you know, some kind of British style amps. And then one night I broke a string and they let me borrow, um, the singer, Martin, let me borrow his Les Paul. So I played a Les Paul into an AC30 and I was like, no, this is amazing. What is this? You know, like <laughs> it really like changed my like whole perspective. I was like, I have to have a Les Paul. Yeah. And, uh, so before I even went down the road with the telly thing, I gave up the like boutique guitar thing. I was like, I'm just going to get a Les Paul and go into an AC30 with a few pedals. And like, that's, um, that's it. That's, I found the sound, you know? Yeah. And um, so that kind of started that whole thing. So, you know, every night that they would play, I'd go stand out front and watch them, or I'd go back and listen to Stu's amps. And this is the same of every tour. We, we you know, we opened for a lot of bands for many years. It's just, you know, yeah. what you do, you know, yeah. the label, they figure out a tour that you can get on. Uh, we played on a Stephen Curtis Chapman tour for like 75 dates or something. And uh, his band was, they were great. Uh, there's a guy named Justin York playing guitar in his band and Adam Lester was the other guitarist. Yeah. And they were both, they were different st different styles, but they were both really good. And um, Justin was more like my age and so we became good buddies, but I would go and listen to their amps every night and just, I just would, you know, we'd play a festival and there'd be, yeah. 10 bands on the bill and I'd stand over to the side of the stage and listen to everybody's amps, you know? Cause you can really get this like secret, pull back the curtain kind of thing. Like, oh, well out front it sounds like this, but when you actually go back by the amp, it sounds different than what you might expect, you know? Right. Some guys play quieter than you would expect. Some guys are louder, some guys are brighter. It's just kind of an interesting, oh, um, that, so I really was kind of yeah. soaking all that up, yeah. That, yeah, that's that's one thing that's, that's really interesting is, is hearing the amp and then being able to go out front and hear it through the PA. Yeah. And sometimes what sounds dirtier when you're just listening to the amp will sound somewhat cleaner when you, you know, yeah. go up front or, yeah. you know, there can be things that, you know, of course things can be EQ'd and things like that. Right. But still right. there's just, there's an aspect of like, it's really educational here. It's in the so amp. true. Yeah. It's yeah. so true. 
Were there any like playing concepts or things that you learned? Yeah, I would say the, one of the biggest ones, I, I was listening, we were on this tour and there was this guy named Kendall who was playing guitar. It was an early uh, Passion tour, which was a college movement. Mm -hmm. And we were on this tour and he sounded like a record every night. I'd go stand back by his amp and he sounded perfect. I'm like, yeah. how do you do this? And I think in a, his, in a loving way, he was kind of like, well, you know, you probably, you're young, you get excited, you probably dig into the strings a little too hard and you know, maybe uh, lay back a little bit your timing because he was yeah. really, his time was so good. And that was the first time I'd ever thought about time. You know, yeah. it was like, it never occurred to me. I was so into like, how big can I make my sound, you know? And so I heard these guys play who sounded like a recording, you know? I would listen on back behind the stage or behind a curtain, I'd be like, it sounds like a record. How are they doing this? And um, so I learned about time and about how to play like calmly, like don't, hit the string too hard or you're gonna bend it out of tune. Right. And don't, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so he was really good about his intonation and his time. And then the other thing I would say is being in the studio with our, our first producers, uh, where I would learn about playing was kind of your question. Yeah. Um, I remember our first producers, we had two of them that were kind of working on this first record. We actually made it here in Franklin at the Bennett House. Yeah. And I was like 19. And uh, it was a record called Not To Us. It was the first thing I'd ever played on ever. Uh, in a proper studio with this producer. And I remember the pr producer being like, hey, because I was probably just trying to come up with like some cool guitar part that I thought was cool. And he was like, listen to Chris's vocal as like we're, as we're trying to write a part for this song. Like if he takes a breath or there's a space, maybe that's the moment that you step out, but like don't play on top of the vocal. And I was like, right. oh, it never occurred to me, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then the other producer uh, was really funny and he kept saying, he was uh, from New Zealand, he'd be like, man, you need to write like a stoner guitar part for this song. I was like, what? <laughs> of course, it was a funny thing to say to someone who's making like a worship record. I was like, right. stoner guitar. He's like, yeah, like the entire chorus, just play like one note, maybe two notes. Yeah. And it really yeah. like, and it opened my eyes to like how cool it would sound if, you, if you're playing like one or two notes over the same progression and it never right. changes. And it like opened my ears to like what that, could feel like the tension of like a note that maybe isn't in that chord rubbing up against that chord. And like all of a sudden you started getting this like, you know, uh, so it's probably those two things, like listen for the vocal yeah. and play less notes. You know? Yeah, and, and, the, and then the first thing you had indicated about, you know, not playing so heavy handed and thinking about timing, those are all amazingly important concepts right. that, that, that you were taught. I I've see so many people that can take a guitar that's in tune and they can pick it up, and they will make it sound out of tune by you yeah. know by the fact that they don't they don't play with a, a, a proper touch. Yeah. yeah, it's a hard lesson to especially yeah. live, right? Because yeah. you, you get excited, yeah. and it's hard and you not start, to. And you yeah. start digging in too hard, and all of a sudden you're you're playing heavy handed, and you're actually overplaying the instrument. Yeah, yeah. and listening back is helpful, right? You hear yeah. you hear like a recording of you playing live, and be like, "Gosh, I'm so I'm yeah. rushing. I didn't realize I was rushing like that." You know, it's good yeah. to hear that stuff. Yeah, and, and and then the concept of just not playing over the vocal. Yeah, that's a huge that's a, lesson to learn. Yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. I still think about those two guys. They were so yeah. helpful to me. Who were they? So Matt Bronley was the um, okay uh, was a producer um, who was uh, a big writer and producer, yeah. um, and uh, I think he he had done like the early Jars of Clay stuff. So that was a fun like it was really as a fan of that of that band. That was cool to get to hang out with him, and he was so good about like coming up with these simple little guitar licks and stuff that would just be like perfect for the song, you know, and that really yeah. shaped me. And then the other guy, uh, his name was uh, Sam Gibson. He was um, really like a really good mixer and um, I was producing some too, so. Yeah. And then we later met a guy named Ed Cash, the next record, and right. Ed kind of became the guy that Chris and Ed really became um, like a, a duo. Yeah, because so they, yeah, he's still pr producing yeah, yeah. and co-writing. Yeah. And, so we've been working with him for like 14 years now, and he he shaped my playing and sound in a, in a whole bunch of different other ways. Okay. But So, so how are some ways in which oh, okay. Ed, Ed yeah. Cash is influenced? Well, you know, when we met Ed, he, he came from like a really, um, uh, um, a, a different place. Like I came from like this kind of like, I really wanted everything to sound like this Brit rock kind of stuff and he came from like more like he loved Stevie Wonder and he loved kind of like um, stuff that was like a little more, I don't know, maybe had more color to it, like the notes, you know? Yeah. And um, and he also loved uh, Zeppelin. He was like, he knew all the like Zeppelin, Zeppelin riffs and stuff, which is really, you know, obviously very colorful stuff, yeah. you know? Um, but Ed was really good about um, feel, 
Like that's really what I feel like I taught Ed would, you know, we'd sit there and he was so patient with me. God bless that man. I was so young and uh, we'd sit there for, I think that first record we made together was called Arriving and we sat together in his like little studio for like two weeks and just spent so much time with every tone. We'd plug in the shortest cable we could get, make sure that the signal path was clean and we would go over every little thing. And um, he was really good about, um, let's get a, a sound, let's really work on getting a good tone. And then uh, he would always work on my feel, be like, hey, like, you know, lay it back, you know, let's make it feel right, listen to the drums, listen to the, you know. And so he was really, his time is insane. Like, he, he's a great player, but his right hand is really, blew my mind. And um, sometimes he would even reach over and like tap my leg as we were playing, like, here's the pattern. And he'd be like, see how that feels with the kick drum? And he'd like, yeah. he'd just kind of walk, hold my hand through the whole process. Yeah. And it really changed me as a player because he really was an emotional, like, he was not a heady guy. He was more like from the heart. And so he would, be like, well, don't, don't worry about the chord. It sounds like this, you know? Like, yeah. I don't know what to call it, but play this chord, you know? Yeah. And uh, he really changed my playing in that way. He's just, uh, just from the heart. He's such a, like, he's looking for that magic thing. It's like, I'd be like, man, I don't know if that take, I think I messed up that one. And he's like, no, man, it felt amazing. Like, so to me, to hit for him, it was like, I don't care, like, mentally what was going on. Yeah. Like, what does it feel like in the yeah. track, you know? And that really, you know, changed me a lot, just kind of, thinking about the, he's great about the big picture, you know. Very cool. <laughs> Sorry if that's too much. <laughs> no, no, no. Those, those I love are, those Ed. He's such a killer player and singer. And oh man, he's, he's been like a, a mentor to the whole band. It's been good. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's just amazing that at times these different people in, in your career will take the time to teach you those things instead of, because right. so easily they could have put, you know, pressure on Chris saying, you really you know, Daniel doesn't need to be playing on this. Right, you know, exactly. Like Ed could have played on there instead, yeah. or they could have, you know, hired, you know, whoever in yeah. town. Yeah. But for them to take the time to really You're right. hone, you know. Your... And I became so much of a better player because of the yeah. time they spent. And yeah. like you said, I mean, to Chris's credit, he he really kind of went to bat for us to play on the record, which, yeah. you know, it's not really in the producer or the label's interest to have a 20-year-old playing on a record. They'd right. rather have a guy who can come in and knock out the whole record in like That's four right. hours. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, it's a lot more cost effective. <laughs> but then you've you've lear learned that, and then all of a sudden you're bringing all these skills every time sure. you make the record, yeah. and, and it, and it yeah. becomes, you know, more singular, yeah. you know, sounding. Yeah, so. I'm very I'm very grateful to, to Chris and those, uh, those producers for being patient with me, you know. Yeah. So you're playing on his records and his career is kind of moving along. You've gone from riding around in a suburban to a conversion <laughs> van to a to a bus. When was there kind of a um, a moment of and and not to be, you know, kind of egocentric, but where a, a moment when you felt like, okay, I think I've kind of we're kind of we're really doing this and we're really, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make it. When was there a moment where you kind of felt that way? Gosh, I don't I mean, there were so many years of, of it, right? Either you're just yeah. building it, building it, moving, yeah. you know, touring. Um, you know, I guess probably this one of the like real mile markers for us uh, would have been like uh, probably in '04. Uh, we put out an album that had like his first radio um, songs that did well on radio. Because when we first started uh, making records um, for Christian music, for you know, for anybody who's listening that doesn't know, like Christian. Christian radio, they weren't really playing church music. It was like right. pop songs and, right. uh, but worship music wasn't really something that was on the radio. Yeah. So that's what they would say. They, we would go to play these radio stations and be like, that's a great song, you know, that's cool. Because uh, we'd be like promoting whatever the sing we thought the single was. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, that was more of Chris and the label. I was just along for the ride. But 
they would be like, oh, that's cool. Maybe we'll put it in our Sunday morning rotation on the radio. And that yeah. was it, you know? Yeah. Um, because you were going against the grain. Right, you yeah. Know, the, the grain, you know, at, at that point, you know, Christian radio was mainly playing more, you know, pop songs. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this was this was you know on, this the, on the yeah. cutting edge. You yeah. know, it's like we're no, we're doing we're doing worship songs. Yeah. and it didn't feel revolutionary to us because it's the only yeah. thing I'd ever played with Chris. And uh, Chris, to his credit, that's who he always was. You know, he wasn't trying yeah. to be something he wasn't. Yeah, and um, and then there was kind of this explosion of worship music around that time, and all of a sudden the radio started playing these songs and realized, oh, people want to hear these songs in their car or on their what, yeah. you know at, at work or. Um, and so it's, it was a really a cool thing to to realize there was uh, a validity to all this music in a commercial sense because we we felt it when we would lead worship at camps and conferences and concerts. So I guess around '04 he had a song called "Indescribable" that was like the first radio single that right. did well, and then that same record he had a song called "Holy Is the Lord" that um, uh, gained some traction, and then uh, "How Great Is Our God" was on that record, which became like a global song for Chris. Yeah. So I guess that was the first time maybe we started going, whoa, like this is, you know, this is big. Cause it, yeah. we were, Chris likes to say, we were chasing our songs around the world. You know, it's like his songs would get there to the church or to the town way before we ever played there, you know, because yeah. people were playing them in their churches. Yeah. And so a lot of people knew Chris's songs, but didn't know him as an artist, you know? So it was probably, you know, I don't even know, a decade of touring with Chris before he became any kind of like household name in like Christian yeah. circles. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's like, I guess it was probably that record was maybe a turning point where where we realized like, man, these songs are getting out there, yeah. you know? And when we go play places, people know these songs, you know, they really, uh, there was some momentum. And that was like kind of the first time we stopped opening for bands and started doing our own touring at the same time. And so that was another kind of mile marker was like, Instead of us just playing our 20 minutes before the big headliner, um, we got to play an hour and a half and create our own set list. And, you know, yeah. and people were paying money to come see just Chris's concert. You know, right. you're not depending on anyone else's name to sell the tickets. And so that was kind of a cool couple of years there where there was like some real momentum, you know. Yeah. Was there challenges, you know, because again, you, you know, you were opening shows for artists that are, I guess, more playing like, you know, they're they're more, you know, pop. They're not playing worship songs. Sure. Yeah. So was that kind of a, a, not that it was awkward, but was it just, you know, kind of? Um, That's a great question. You know, it's interesting because I, what's cool, what's really great about Chris is he, from stage, he has so much charisma. Yeah. And such a kind of relationship with the people that. Um, he was just himself. Like, doesn't matter where yeah. we were, if we were at some festival and, and what they heard all day was like, you know, screamo bands and metal bands and whatever else. It's like, when yeah. we got up there, Chris was himself. You know, we just right. did what we do, you know? Yeah. And we're, not, we, we're never trying to be something we yeah. aren't, you know? And um, even from the earliest, earliest days of touring, Chris would tell us like, man, I want to, I want like, he always used Garth Brooks as a model. And, um, not from like a hundred million records sold way, but yeah. like a, when you watch his concerts, there's like little kids, high schoolers, young adult, grandparents, it's the whole spectrum. And that's kind of what always was his vision for uh, for touring. And it's been cool to watch that happen because now when we go play our concerts, it is that. It's really every shape and size and color and families and grandparents and it's really, f and but then young kids too. And yeah. um, so it's uh, it's been fun to watch that all grow and change but really yeah to answer your question he he kind of was always just himself we'd be we just kind of go in there into some environment and be like hey we don't know how this is going to be received but let's just yeah. do what we do and was there any challenges when you're playing worship music in really large venues you know yeah that's uh, man chris probably felt that more than the band because um you know he really is aware um of how how a song is going over more mm -hmm. or less, you know. Without, um, I heard Chris Martin once say in an interview that like they know what songs are working, which ones aren't by the exit signs in an arena, because uh -huh. that's like that's a little bit of light out there. And he goes, yeah. and if I start seeing everybody flood out to the bathrooms during that song, we'll cut yeah. it from the set list. <laughs> <laughs> like that's not that one's not working. That's when everyone went to the bathroom. Yeah. And so Chris is really sensitive to all that, and and was really always in tune with like. Hey man, I don't think people are connecting with that song. Let's change the set list, you know. Yeah. Um, 
It does change. I mean, like he changes the way that we lead if it's a smaller room, for sure. Yeah. I've definitely, you know, he'll he'll strip it back or a lot of times we're at the, like at a festival or you know, they get people's ears just get assaulted all day, right? By sound. It's not yeah. not that it's bad noises, but like yeah. it's just so much just kick drum, kick drum, kick drum, guitar, 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 all day. And then by the time we get up there, sometimes Chris will be like, man, let's have like two or three songs in the middle of the set list that are acoustic or chill or something just to give people a moment to like lean forward a little bit. Because they've been right. sitting in their camper yeah. all day, you they've, know, hanging out and it's just been band, band, band. Yeah. And it's like, let's create a moment. You know, let's, like, let's create something memorable that people can like sing along or lean forward. And that really is the big difference, I think, with our touring would be the people singing. Yeah. And it's like, it's one thing to hear a band play, a great band play a song, but when you hear an entire crowd of people, thousands and thousands of people worshiping together and singing together, that's really different. You know, yeah. that's, that's like a, that's a game changer, you know? Yeah. And a lot of, you know, in a lot of, you know, rock and country shows, you know, you'll see people singing, singing along, but in this situation, it seems, you know, that you're, it's, it's more of a participation thing. Yeah, yeah. Them, them just happen to be singing along. Right, you're right, because yeah. people do sing along at concerts, but it yeah. feels a little different yeah. in like a the, church atmosphere. Yeah, and there's an intentionality on, on the yeah, part of, absolutely. of Chris and the band, you know, where yeah. it's like this is a participation thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really. Yeah. What about the challenges of you as a guitar player all of a sudden playing these these bigger venues? Did you had to... Is it harder to control, you know, your uh, the guitar and 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 thinking about how, you know, uh, you you fill sound and and how you yeah. kind of operate in in that? Well, it really change. Rooms? It definitely changes the yeah. way you play. Yeah. Because um, if you're playing in a big place, like an arena, for example, like for yeah. the lack of a better term. Yeah. If it's a big place and there's lots of sound bouncing around, well, you know some of the clarity and some of the um, uh, like definition gets lost, right? So it really shapes the way, I remember going to see um, U2 play at an, at an arena, like my first U2 show I went to go see, and I was like, oh man, the parts that really translate are these kind of like higher, s simple guitar parts. And it kind of like made me think, oh, well that's what makes sense. Like, you know, if it's down low and you're kind of like, doing a lot of this stuff, you know, you may not hear that in an arena if there's a lot of notes going on, but if you yeah. hear like one little like note soaring over the chorus, it's easier to kind of hear it in the context, context of a big boomy room, you know? Yeah. So I think it does shape the way that I played. I, I started, um, I was the only electric guitar player, so I, I would say playing a bigger room, one, one, one thing that changed was adding an amp. So I played with two amps instead of one. It's yeah. like, okay, well that made things feel a little bigger. And, um, you know, it changed the way that I thought about the pedals and stuff because it was it was less about, you know, it's it's easy to get into all that stuff and I love that stuff, but like I would realize like out front, you know, you may not hear the difference between uh, four different overdrive pedals out front. Yeah. You know, yeah. so like pick the one that really cuts through the mix or that works for the song, for works for the thing or pick a simple couple of uh, pedals that you love that were, that enhance, but really, out there, especially in a big room, it's like, man, it can really get lost. So it definitely changes the way that I play. Um, I'm naturally a kind of simplistic player, but playing in big rooms really makes me want to play simple because you, at, that's what seems to translate, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little limited as a player anyway. I'm not a fast uh, player, and some of those limitations have helped me because it helps me I have to write parts because I, I'm not a guy who can just wing some fast solo off the top of my head, I have to really write parts. And as I'm writing parts, I'm thinking about what room it's going to be in. So yeah. it's all kind of one thing for me. Well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, melodies, you know, and, and hummable, you know, guitar parts, you know, mm -hmm. win out, especially right. playing, you know, I mean, really playing in anything, you know, yeah. there's a time where, you know, guitar can just be acrobatics. Right, right. But, yeah. Which is always impressive. I'm yes. always envious of those guys, but I, but no one ever wants that on any records that I play on, or at least right. they, well, of course, they, I mean, they know me well enough to go, not, they're not coming to me for that if they want me to play something. But. Yeah, there's not much guitar acrobatics on, on, on recordings. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong, day. I mean, I yeah. love some of that stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, like uh, some of those, some of those records I love and I, I, I'm fascinated by it, but yeah, for, for the application of live music that we play for our style, it's, you know, it's more of a part driven thing, you know? Yeah. 
So how do you come up with parts? You know, it kind of, it's always different. I mean, sometimes it's um, like Chris will be trying out a song at like Soundcheck. Yeah. So that was like a lot of the early days. It was, um, we were at Soundcheck and Chris would be like, hey, I got this new song. I want to try to work into the set list soon. So we'll start just kind of working it at Soundcheck every day yeah. on tour. And so I would just start noodling around with the guitar part until until somebody was like, hey, that's cool, you know, whatever, yeah. I like that, or, you know. Yeah. So I'd kind of lean on my band guys a lot for their ears, like, wait till someone's eyes lit up a little bit. Yeah, or, and then you know you finally, you know, you've, yeah. you've hit on the right yeah. thing. Yeah, um, and, and there's then, that, yeah. And then does that part, uh, does that make it all the way onto the recording? Sometimes, when it, yeah. yeah. It's funny, like, sometimes it's like, it becomes part of the DNA of the song, and Chris yeah. really gets attached to it. And a lot of guys make you know demos and so if you if your part makes it into the demo it's way more likely to end up on the record because right. people get lo demo love right you yeah. get so attached to the way the demo yes. sounds and so um if i get to be a part of the demo process a lot of producers make their own demos and they're, they're so good now with like all the stuff they can do on their computer but like if i so sometimes it's a part that's already in the demo and chris is like hey I really like that part from the demo. Can you just play that? So then, of course, I'll play it if it if, yeah. it's, if it works for the song. And then sometimes it's like the producer will come to me and say, "Hey, forget the demo. Let's come up with something better." You know. And then it's just gut instinct as far as how the part gets written. It's just like, okay, well, let's just play the song a few times, and I'll just start trying some stuff till we land on something. And um, so then I don't know where that part comes from. You yeah. know, that's that's just a. It just, it just came out. It's something in yeah. what you hear. It's like. It's similar to songwriting, I would say, for me. Yeah. I try to think like a, a writer let more than a guitar player. Like what 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 works within the context of the song? Cause no one's buying, you know, they buy these records because they love the songs more yeah. than they buy the records to hear me play guitar. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm trying to think about okay, what's the song? What does the song need, you know? Yeah. And a lot of times it's a really amazing song. Like really recently we you know, did this one song that I was like, man, I don't want to mess this up. This is so beautiful. Like, I'll, I'm happy to play on it, but like, yeah. I don't want to, this is really good. And I feel yeah. that way a lot because Chris is such a great songwriter. Yeah. He'll be like, he'll come to the studio with something. I'm like, man, that is gorgeous. I don't want to mess this up, you know? Yeah. So it's, then you start trying to think of it in like a, approach it reverently, you know, which is, is, is unusual for electric guitar players who play loud. It's like, well, how do I play this in a way that, um, matches the, what the what the song is saying you know yeah so talk about uh because you also write with chris um, uh -huh. yeah so tell, tell us about getting into songwriting how did how did you get into it i would say it's probably watching chris do it on the road he's such yeah. a prolific songwriter. he writes all the time yeah. and every time we would have downtime at like a youth camp or i mean that's going back a ways or even now on tour he's constantly working on songs with his acoustic or piano and our, um, we had a bass player for the longest time who wrote with him. So they were kind of like a songwriting um, duo. And I would sit around and just watch them do it for hours mm -hmm. and um, occasionally suggest a song, uh, like an idea within the song, though I was petrified to do so because I right. was like, I had ideas. So I think it, my brain or in my heart, I felt like I've got ideas for songs. Like I feel connected to this. This is something I, I think I'm passionate about, but I had no experience. Yeah. And, um, so uh, I watched Chris write and write and write. For each record, he'd write 40 songs, you know, and then we'd only record 10 of them. Yeah. And so that was really, really inspiring to learn that, like, even someone who I really admired as a songwriter had songs that people didn't like. You know, the label would be like, we don't like three-fourths of what you turned in, you know what I mean? Because they would only keep 10 songs for the record. And so, like, and even Chris would say, you know, there's songs that just weren't any good. And um, so I think I learned... Oh, it's about doing it over and over and over. And so sort of that doing it for the process thing that has now become a popular phrase. But at the time, it was just like, I felt like, man, how am I going to do this? So I would just write and write and write. And then I would show him an idea if I got brave enough. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where the first working together on songs started was me saying, hey, I've got this idea. And he was kind enough to have, to, you know, listen to my ideas and uh, Jesse as well, our other bass player, he was he was really good about, hey, show Chris that idea. I think that's pretty yeah. good, but you need to be like a little braver about showing him your... Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so I, watching them do it and then um, being around a lot of great songwriters, I, I really 
kind of became passionate about it. And so it's something I really love. I do a lot of, but I just, um, Chris was kind enough to like record some of them, you know, that he liked. And then we worked together on some of them. And um, yeah, it's a wild thing. The songwriting thing is so like, it's so fun. and so like uh, discouraging all at the same time. You you really had to, to take a risk because when, you know, when people are, people are writing, a lot of times the last thing they want is input from anyone else and they'll and, and they can get really offended. Right, yeah, yeah. And so you you really kind of have to be carefully kind of put it out there. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's a delicate balance, right? Yeah. Cuz if you come in too heavy-handed then it's kind of like hey man, yeah. this isn't even your song. What are you you know, you're yeah. a little too vocal. Yeah. And so I think it was about yeah, it's definitely like read the room kind of thing. Like yeah. if this person's open to input, maybe try to start working on it. And I wasn't even really trying to like wiggle my way in. It was just more I was fascinated with the process. I wanted to be a part of it, you know. Yeah. And um, so I think that kind of is where that started. Yeah, yeah. you're right though. It's it's hard because you. I'm not a kick the door in and hey everybody listen to me. That's not yeah. my personality. Check out this song. <laughs> no, I was never or, that way. Or, I'm gonna fix your song with this. Yeah. <laughs> this Even as a guitar one. player, yeah. that's not I don't feel that way. I'm not a I'm not a everyone hear me roar yeah. kind of person, which those people really a lot of times maybe can find more success because they're more willing to put themselves out there. So I'm constantly trying to like, you know, push myself to be a little more like, hey, I have an idea. Because he's so open. He loves when I bring ideas to the table, but I just yeah. You know, so yeah. Well, what are some of the songs that you've uh, you know co-written with Chris? Um, so I think the first first song that would have um, that we worked on together that maybe would have um, gotten any kind of like uh, traction or what people might know is a, was a song called Jesus Messiah mm-hmm. that uh, was we made that on a record in two thousand eight. Okay. And uh, just started with a an idea I had that I showed him, which was kind of like the chorus melody and like some of the first verse. Yeah. And uh, he really took to it. It's like, man, I really think there's something here. So we worked on it with um, Jesse and I think um, Ed. And um, yeah, I was so shocked because when we got in the studio, it was like, oh man, we're working on this song. I, really, yeah. I can't believe this. Like we're at yeah. Ocean Way making a proper record and you know, it's getting real drums yeah. <laughs> and it's getting real attention from everyone as if it was like all the other songs. Right. And then when the record was about to come out, they're like, hey, I think we're going to release this as the first single. And I was just like, I can't yeah. believe this is happening, you know. Yeah. And um, at the time in Chris's career, I think because of the traction he had, not just because of the song, it was some sort of like mile marker for ads on radio or something at the time. Yeah. And it was just like so wild. I was like, I can't believe this is happening, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was probably the first one. That, and then we worked together on a handful of songs after that, um, you know, just kind of here and there sprinkled throughout the records, um, two or three of them on like a Christmas record that we worked on together. And so it's just fun. It was like, you know, he was really, it kind of gave me the bug to keep keep going. You know, it was like a little bit of a nudge in the right direction. Like, hey, this could be something that you can pursue, you know, this is yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about, kind of some the way that you approach playing on songs sure the way you approach playing with chris well man i it's weird because i i guess one of the earliest things i realized you know playing uh in in this band or in, in this kind of music is that um being the only electric guitar player i was like man i gotta play like something big you know i need to fill out some sound yeah. in early days we didn't even have a keys player so it was like i was the only melodic instrument because chris would play a acoustic with like, you know, mostly chords. We had bass and drums. Yeah. So everything else had to come from my world. And um, so for years I would like, I would create like, I remember when I first got the like green line six pedal, I would create like a pad with a bunch of swells and reverse sounds and stuff. So kind of sound like a keyboard pad. And I would I'd create it before the concert and I would bring the volume all the way down. And then right before we started our first song, I'd reach down and like pull that up. Like that was our keyboard pad <laughs> was my green line six pedal. Yeah. And it would just be coming through the amp with all the other notes. Yeah. Uh, because that's the only way I knew how to run it. But so I would say the approach for me was, uh, was kind of this hybrid of like lead rhythm. Because yeah. it was like, I wasn't a traditional like lead player the way you would think of like a blues player. Um, Cause that didn't fit the music. And I also couldn't just play like, you know, like, you know, like kind of like cowboy chords either, because it was like, well, Chris is already playing like real, like acoustic, you know, kind of basic acoustic chords. Yeah. So I was like, well, I need to play something different. So if he'd play G, I would be like, well, if I play G too, that's fine. But like, 
what else could I do with that? So then I started, um, you know, trying to figure out, well, how can I play a different G to like make it sound interesting and get a little bit of melody and play uh, big enough. So like I started kind of like um, doing like these hybrid um, string kind of combinations where I would like let one string like uh, ring the whole time and play like a little melody over the top. So an example would be like if I'm playing the G string open and then playing the um, B string at the same time, and yeah. then I could find like little melodies among among uh, within that, which would sound like. Um, so like, yeah. as opposed to just that's one string, and then if you yeah. add the G, if you add the G string with yeah. it, it's a little fatter. And yeah. so then I started thinking, well, how can I make it even fatter but still get the? And so I would be like, okay, what can I play like? You know, you know, like a. Um, okay, that's a little bit different than. This, yeah. so I was kind of like constantly trying to figure out, well, what's the, what are the ways I can play chord shapes that fit his chord, but it's not the same chord. You know, it's not exactly the same. And the capo really became um, uh, an eye opener for me, and less of a crutch. It wasn't like, oh, I can't play in uh, the key of whatever, so I'll just use the capo. It was more like I like having these open strings. Yeah. And no. so, like for example, if we're staying in G, I would capo three a lot. And then I would have two strings that I could keep up with, which are the B and the yeah. E. And then I thought, well, now I can play all my melody on the G string. So I can play like, you know, like. So you start realizing yeah. like, oh, okay, that's a way to get a fuller sound and a little bit of melody. So it sounds like one guy going. And it sounds yeah. like another guy's going. Yeah. So it's like a way of playing two guitarists' guitar parts. And then when we get to like a chorus or something, then I would maybe open up big chords because it needed to fill out. Yeah. So, you know, dynamically, or as a guitarist in the band, I was constantly thinking of like, well, how can I make the chorus feel as big as possible or, or appropriate? You know, if it's a big song, it needs to feel big. Uh, I can't just be up here like, you know, playing some little tiny part on a big chorus. I need something right. that's got some like drive and attitude and something powerful. Yeah. So I was like, well, what key can I play in that allows me to hit big chords and have a little bit of melody? Yeah. So it's this lead rhythm hybrid thing. And a lot of that came to do with open strings. You know, you could play um, in the same key with capo three. You can also play all your melody on the B string and leave the open G ring. So it became about, it's this game of like, well, where can I put the capo, yeah. keep an open string ringing maybe in the root or like the fifth or something, and then play around with these weird voicings. And so it became like, you know, an example in that key would be like um, playing on the B string with the open G ringing. So that'd be like. So that's the same, it's the yeah. same game you're playing with the G string I showed yeah. you. And it's all the same, you know, kind of ideas. And I would just move it around and I'd play in the key of G or E or D or whatever it worked and try to find common notes and stuff that would give me like yeah. an interesting chord or something. So you might do something like that for an intro uh -huh. and then and then typically, you know, how yeah, how would you you map out like, okay, I'm gonna play this in the intro, and then you would think about, you know, maybe what you're gonna play, you know, verse one. Maybe you're gonna drop right. out, maybe you're gonna yeah. play something real simple. Well, they, it kind of that's the fun game. It's like, yeah. well, what what can the intro be? Because it, yeah. you know, um, we wanted a lot of times we want something that sounds like a signature. So when the song starts, if you know this music, you're yeah. like, oh, that's the like that. I love bands that have like an intro to the song that is recognizable. So when I go see yeah. them play live and that opening riff comes on, I'm like, yes, I yeah. love this song. Yeah. You know, it's like you that know. feeling, yeah. yeah. And so I'm always thinking about. I mean, some songs are piano intros, that's fine. Yeah. But if it's a guitar thing, it's like, well, what's gonna be like that thing that right when the song starts, it's instantly, uh, there's some recognition there. So that's that's the game in the studio, me and the producer. Yeah. It's kind of always like, man, what's the like hook gonna be? Like we need like that thing that's not too busy, but sounds original, but is a little bit unique, but can't be, it has to fit within like, two to four bars because then the song starts. You know, it right. can't be some long yeah. music piece a lot of the times. And I mean, sometimes it can be. So yeah, so it's it's kind of a constant game of like, sometimes it's hinting at the melody of the song without just playing the melody of the song. Mm -hmm. um, 
And sometimes it's just um, like a real, like a kind of a droney back and forth thing that's just more of a texture thing. And then you let the vocal take the verse, you know? Um, so yeah, you're just kind of listening to the dynamics of the song, right? If the song kind of starts uh, with this big intro, well, you need something that's very soaring and like inspiring sounding that would be like fit the music. And if it's more of like a subdued thing, I'm using verb and delay and kind of making it real washy and more gentle and just kind of finding the right dynamics, you know? And then if we recorded one song recently that like almost the whole chorus, I was playing like an open E with a ringing string. So the whole yeah. chorus, th throughout the almost the whole chorus, there's this like And it sounds so silly on its own, but in the track, it was like, oh, that guy adds some like energy. I mean, the tone was more driving than that, yeah. but it just, it was just enough to kind of push the song into like a good territory tonally. So um, it's just that game of like finding like, okay, what's that first verse picture feel like? What's the chorus picture feel like? You know, each one is so different. I think of them in like, it's like chapters of a book. There's not like, it's not like, I'm gonna play the same thing the whole song because then you just your ears are so tired of it. You know, you try right. to like find ways to like dip out during the verse so that it means something when it comes back in. It's like, right. how do I make this guitar part mean something? Well, what if I don't play until the bridge? And then when I come in with that part, all of a sudden it just like opens up and it's a whole different picture. You know, it's that kind of stuff. Do you tend to change sounds during a song? Yeah. Um in the studio a lot. Yeah. You're just yeah. it's the sky's the limit. Live. Um, you know, I try not to, I try not to get too experimental because you can, can kind of get lost in all that. And so, yeah, I'll change like maybe the verses I might like, especially like, it depends on the song. Yeah. An example would be the verse might be, uh, lots of verb and kind of swelly stuff. If it's like a, uh, that kind of song, maybe with some light picking. And then when the chorus hits, I'll dry it up and hit big chords, you know, yeah. um, or could be the opposite. Maybe the verse is real muted and like, you know, like muted and kind of like fits with the drums as you're thinking more ryth rhythmically. And then when the chorus hits, you add verb and delay to make it sound wider, you know? Um, so I definitely think about it in like sections. It's like, well, I, I never just am winging it. You know, when we go on tour, by the time we get to the concerts, I've got a plan for like my verse, I have a verse part a chorus yeah. part, a bridge part, an intro part, an outro. I've got five guitar parts for every song. You just memorize that many guitar parts for, for the yeah. tour, you know? Because that's what makes it interesting. Because if you just kind of play kind of the same sound and the same kind of part, you know, through the verses and chorus and intro and yeah. everything, it's just boring as all get out. Yeah. It doesn't differentiate the different right, parts right, of the right. song. People yeah. get bored quickly. Yeah, it is helpful to change it up, unless it's just one of those like buildy kind of songs where the yeah. point is that I don't play anything different and everything else changes. Yeah. Like the drums change, but the guitar is kind of still doing right. the same little pattern. But as a general rule, I'm, I'm writing a new guitar part per section of yeah. the song, yeah. Any other thoughts on, uh, on the musical you know, I, approaches? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, there's definitely an art to the like sim simple thing, you know. It's like it, yeah. I, so many times over the years, I've played a guitar part for a producer. I'll have this idea over it, like, and and usually what they'll say is, "I like the movement of that," or "That's cool." Just yeah. play it half as many times. Yeah. You know, so it's like if the idea I had is like um, I'm trying to think of what like a if the idea I have is some like floaty kind of guitar part that's like. Uh, some like little thing that kind of sits over the course, they might be like, okay, I like what that's doing, but let's do it once yeah. and then let it sit. So it'll be like, you know, that might, so that might float over the picture and then like give it a bar and then play it again. Yeah. You know, that's just like a whatever example, but like, yeah. so they'll tell me to play it half as many times or they'll say half as many notes. Yeah. So it's like same idea, but like just play less notes, but I like the way that feels, you know? So. Yeah. Sometimes it's about finding like, is it an eighth note thing? Is it a 16th note thing? Like what rhythmically needs to fit with the part? Um, so it's just the art of finding, to me, that's the fun of the, of the game is like, how simple can I play it? And how effective can it be? You know, like yeah. I don't want it to be boring. I want it to be effective, but I don't, I want to play the simplest thing I can and make the song like speak, you know? Yeah. 
and at the end of the day, that's much more desirable. Sure, yeah, you know, for to, that kind of music, yeah, probably, yeah. To play, you know, to play parts and to think like an arranger or a producer. Sure, yeah, and 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 that's what you know. At the end of the day, that's that's those are the the, the money tones and the money yeah. notes. Yeah, uh, I saw. Yeah. I was at a guitar shop in Austin years ago. Austin Vintage Guitars, and there was this guy behind the glass who was just all. I mean, he's just sh shredding all over the fretboard. And I was kind of listening to that, and he was, you know, he was in the amp room, so it was real loud. And there was this uh, older guy who was sitting next to me, he's just sitting in the shop, kind of playing some acoustics and stuff. And and I was young, and I was kind of like listening to that guy. And um, and the older man who's sitting next to me, he looks over me, and he kind of shook his head like this, listening to that guy in there. Yeah. And he goes, "This is where you make all your money down here." <laughs> <laughs> and he pointed to like his cowboy cord, like, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh man, there's so much like." like wisdom and what he just yeah. said and there's a there's a value in that too yeah and obviously all, all my guitar heroes can do that stuff it's just that the point he was making really resonated with me which was um you know a lot of your favorite songs maybe don't even have that stuff you know so. yeah yeah <laughs> Daniel, let's talk gear. Hey, that's the fun part, right? That's, we, that's the all fun guitar part. players love this. We, we this love to talk gear. Me so, included. Well, good. Let's talk about, uh, tell me this telly that you've been holding the whole time. That's a really cool thin line. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, this was kind of a, a dream bucket list guitar for me was to, to yeah. get a thin line telly. I always wanted one. Um, and uh, so I, man, I probably wanted one of these for about a decade before I finally pulled the trigger. And uh, yeah, I found this actually in Nashville at um, at Gruen. I was um, my wife, who's just amazing, was I, she saw me looking at this the same guitar online for you know weeks and weeks, and we had just moved to Nashville, and she was like, she's like, I see you staring at this guitar all the time. Like, do you want one of those? And I was like, well, yeah, yeah but I mean they're expensive, and I, you know I don't know. We got some things we need to pay for and stuff. She's like, well, I'm gonna take our son Judah. She's like, I'm gonna take Judah out to run some errands and um i'll be gone about three hours just go get it i was like what yeah. <laughs> so i'm like you know first thing in the morning i got my cup of coffee i'm yeah. like really yeah. she's like yeah i'll just you know she's like i i know it's your job and if, if, if you need yeah. to go get something like if you if you need to pull the trigger on something because i historically don't pull the trigger on like buying things and she's yeah. like just do it it's your job and I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta take this. This window might close. <laughs> That's right. Tomorrow she might feel different. Right now, she said, go get it. So she leaves, and I get on the phone and I start calling everyone, all the guitar shops I could think of in Nashville, like who yeah. has who has a thin line. Yeah. Like she just saw me looking at one on reverb or something. And so I called several because I love Carter and I love Gruen. I called Gruen, called both of them. But Gru Gruen said, Yeah, we've got one here. It's a 72. And I was like, the first year of the, the, the thin line thing with the wide range humbuckers, yeah. cool. And uh, he goes, um, it's black. And I was like, Ooh. amazing. Cause I, yeah. I was, that was kind of, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously I would pick the one that I thought sounded the best or that I felt like I connected with, but I was really excited that it was black cause it was just kind of fun. It's yeah, it's rarer color. So I went down there and he uh, played it and I instantly loved the tone of it, the sound of it. And then, uh, and then he told me he had just been refretted which was like yeah. amazing to find a vintage guitar that had just gotten refretted. And, yeah, it's ready to go. Yeah, and all their p pickups were original, which is really the important part to me um, yeah. as far as like, I don't care about the original, because I knew I was going to tour with it. It was more, wasn't about value, it was more about the, the sound. So yeah, so this has got the wide range humbuckers, it's a 72, it's got the wide range humbuckers in it. And I've always loved tellies, um, and I think this kind of sits in like an interesting place tonally, because it you get the like, the telly kind of, uh, that spanky, you know, honky telly thing, but it's the the humbuckers kind of add just a different flavor to it, and uh, it's been fun live yeah. to kind of, and it's a little quieter too. If you're if you're uh, on a stage where you're getting some weird power and things are buzzy, um, it seems to be a little quieter with the the humbuckers. So yeah, um, but yeah, I really love this guitar. It's been 
it's been really fun to play. Um, and it's lighter than my other tellies because <laughs> it's a thin line. So yeah. it's been really fun. It's become, it's kind of, it's kind of become my, my go-to. Like if I only had one guitar to play on a, on a tour night, I would just play this all night if I had to pick one. Yeah. So. Well, let's, while you've got that guitar, uh, what, what amp are you using? So, uh, touring, I almost, almost always use a, an AC30 that's like a 2001, I think. It's yeah. the 90s era. Yeah. Um, British made uh, with the blue speakers. I think they call it a, it's like a six input TB6 or something, but it's basically that uh, top boost reissue one that they made yeah. for so long. I love those blue speakers and it's just so simple. Like you could literally just set everything in noon and it sounds amazing. You know? I mean, that'd be mm -hmm. too loud, but you know, like yeah. tonally it's pretty easy to dial in. And, uh, and I like amps that don't have a whole lot of knobs. Uh, so when you really, on that amp, when you go into that input, you're only looking at maybe like treble, bass, and cut. Yeah. And they're, it's so forgiving until like, you know, when those amps, like you go, I usually, when I would first dial them in, I would put everything as dark as possible. And then I would just start opening the amp up until it started to chime. You know? Yeah. Because um, if you, on those amps, if you run the um, treble too bright, the bass disappears. Yeah. And if you run the bass too, they're, it's weird. It's the like control, reverse. The controls are very interactive. Yeah. And then, yes. Yeah, I love that yeah. about the amp. It's yeah. so backwards, but it's like the way I learned how to dial in an amp was that AC30. Yeah. And so I, so when I got my matchless, I loved that it was similar in that instead of bass and treble and mid and presence and all these other things that I don't, I don't understand, it had like tone and cut. I was like, amazing. This is what I love. So I just, I would put the cut all the way up so that it was as dark as possible. And then I would just start rolling the cut back until the amp opened up. And then I would just find that sweet spot between how loud the amp needed to be and where the, how bright it was. And then the tone on the matchless was more about cutting bass frequency, it feels like. Okay. The, you can roll it down to get it a little um, cut off some of that. Or like with the telly, sometimes it's nice yeah. to have some of that in there. Do you use the, the top boost channel or the, or the EF86, EF86 on yeah. the matchless? Uh -huh. okay. yeah. yeah. Sorry, I should have def uh, yeah. clarified that. But yeah, that's the channel I kind of fell in love with. Maybe because it's a little hotter or something and yeah. I just love the way it sounds it's it's different enough from my AC30 that I, I use those both live and I found live I don't like to do like wet dry or um, or clean dirty I just have them both going all the time yeah um, just, partly because I don't really have like a lead it's not like oh here's my lead channel and here's my clean my clean channel it's more like they're both up and on and then I'll just hit a boost pedal or a drive pedal if I need more dirt or something yeah. you know and they just, you know, kind of complement each other by the fact that they're, they're you know, they're still kind of in the same family, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and they're, is... they're close enough that I love that big stereo spread in my ears. I and mean, we, we wear, you know, in-ear in monitors. So I put one on, one over to my right and one over to my left. And that feels good. Yeah. Uh, I always love, I got, I've gotten used to that sound. Yeah. And what are you using today? Yeah, today this is a matchless, uh, it's the, it's the DC-30 amp. With the head amp, version. With the head yeah. version, yeah. yeah. And, um... I found for recording, which is why I have it my my place. Uh, every time I would come home off the road, I would have to go to like our storage locker and dig my matchless out of there because if I had any recording to do at home, that was my favorite amp to record. Yeah. I just love the way it records. I don't know why. Yeah. Just it's it's like just loud enough. Like you know, some amps don't break up till they're like slamming the microphone, and some amps break up too soon that you can't really get a lot of body out of it. And this yeah. just seems to be the right for for my playing, just the right amount of like grit and volume yeah. so i just i sold a guitar this year and bought that head because i was like man i gotta have another matchless that doesn't go on the road that i just can have at home for for tracking um and then i keep a cab um over my studio kind of with some sound baffles and stuff that's uh 65 amps okay. cab that's got the blue speaker and the g12h in it oh yeah so you get kind of both yeah. options yeah um because so, the G12H is kind of more of what the the matchless yeah, would have yeah. been would have come with, uh -huh. and then you can have the blue, which kind of pushes it more in the box. Yeah, territory. so that's that's really comfy to me because those are yeah. both of the speakers I'm used to hearing, so I can choose between you know, yeah. and then I let the engineer choose if we're on like a session or something. I'm like, hey, I yeah. got two speakers here, and it's about a 50-50 shot. Some guys are like, oh yeah, I love yeah. blue speakers. Some guys are like, let's do the G12H. So. Yeah, well, let's. Uh, Let's let's talk about your uh, your pedal board here. Yeah, of course. So uh, let's let's hear your uh, like let turn all your effects off. Sure. And let let's just hear your your guitar into your amp just a a, a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, this is with nothing on. 
So this is just the uh, basic sound here. Just a little bit of, you know, just a, a little a hair bit of, of drive on Yeah, that. I like to hit yeah. the, you know, you, it's kind of just, you want to wake the amp up, right? Like if it's yeah. too low, you just, there's no character. Yeah. And if it's too drivey, that, that might work for a part. Yeah. But if you're trying to use a pedal board, sometimes if the amp's too drivey, it's just so messy, you can't control any of the tones. So I like yeah. that kind of happy, happy place where the amp and the speakers kind of fill out. You hear that bass kind of response from the cab and uh, you're starting to get the amp to wake up a little bit, yeah. So let's let's talk about the components that you've got here on your board. So uh, I've kind of gotten used to starting with a volume pedal. That's just something I've always done. Okay. Which is not, you know, there's no wrong way to do it or yeah. right way to do it, I guess I should say. Um, but a lot of guys put their drives first. I've gotten so used to putting the volume pedal first. Um, and what I like about that, and this is kind of a weird part about my, my playing, you know, a lot of guys, uh, especially um, older guys who got used to playing with the, you know, you back it off with your pinky for like a light, clean tone and then you yeah. pull it back up for your like lead sound. I never got used to doing that. I don't, I, maybe it's because I played Les Pauls for so long and you just can't really reach it's it. It's harder to do that, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it's like one of those things. I just never got used to that. So I use the volume pedal that way. Okay. So, um, and I think maybe from playing in so many churches, I could never run the amps like crazy loud. Now we've got better options. You know, I can yeah. I can run them back somewhere with like some long um, DI boxes or something, get it isolated and turn the amps up. But now, uh, back then I couldn't. So what I would do is I would rely on an overdrive pedal for dirt and my clean tone would be this. Yeah. So like pedal up all the way was my loudest, most dirty overdrive sound. And my clean tone was the same pedal just pulled back. Mm -hmm. Which, if your volume pedal is after your drives, that doesn't work. Yeah, it it's the work. same amount of dirt all the right. time. It's just you're controlling your volume level. Yeah, you're not so, controlling your dirt level, which correct. you're able to do that with that yeah, in so, front. So what I like about that, and I can show you an example in a minute, is that I could use my favorite drive pedal and quickly clean up. Yeah, you know, without having to like figure out like, did I have it here? Where was the? You know, and I just it became a feel thing. Yeah, and. Um, even in the context of a big chorus, sometimes like if I've got delay going, I would notice that if it was too dirty, I couldn't hear the way the delays were speaking. And so literally in the middle of a chorus, I might just back my volume pedal back a touch and cleaning up just 10, 20% of that drive, all of a sudden my, I would hear my delays like, kah, 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 yeah. kah. I would hear them like They'd start to up. speak better. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, for me, it was like a tone shape where I was constantly using this to like, how hard do I want to hit the amp and how how much drive and and so like a lot of clean tones for me were never turning the overdrive pedal off. It was just backing, backing off. Backing it off, which really I didn't know this then, but what I like about it now, I'm realizing more and more, is that the drive pedal, especially a TS or like Tube Screamer style pedal, it's got that mid thing. Yes. And so what I liked about cleaning up that way was it still pushed through the mix. So my clean tone had that mid push and it would get through the mix, but it would be cleaner. So yeah. that was kind of a thing that a kind of a technique that I accidentally approached or found or whatever, you know. So yeah, so um, real quick, uh, Barry and the guys at XTS built this beautiful pedal board for me, yeah. and I've since um, ripped up a few things. <laughs> As I'm sure, I think lots of people tell you this. They, yes. There's this confession. They built me this amazing pedal board. They told me not to pull a bunch of pedals off, and I did anyway. Yeah. Um, so they've been amazing. Ever since they've built me this board, it's just been rock solid. And... Um, and you know, I would build them for years, and I just, I, I just got so sick of my horrible like craftsmanship with p cable building and um, even power. Like they, uh, Barry was like, man, I would love to run your entire pedal board off of this True Tone power supply <laughs> if you don't mind. And I'll be like, that'd be amazing, <laughs> all off of one power supply because I was daisy chaining a bunch of stuff together. He was like, no, don't do that. Yeah. It's like, let me get you a real professional power supply that you can <laughs> trust. Yeah, thanks for the prop. That's not that's yeah. not just a plug. It really has been amazing, and yeah. it's under the board, which so we you, can. You got the CS12. CS12 yeah. powering okay. everything. Yeah. And honestly, it's so amazing to walk into a venue, and like recently we were record doing a live record. And the guys were like, man, where's this bus coming from? And we had, it took hours of like hunting down every cable and everything. Yeah. And the whole time, I just had this confidence. I was like, let me just tell you, 
it's not the power. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't build it, yeah. and I know this power supply is good. Yeah. It's clean. The pedals are good. The cables are good. Thank God yeah. I didn't build this pedal board, and I can promise you it's not on my end. Yeah. And it turns out it was like a generator power thing or something that was weird. But yeah, so with the CS12 is powering everything. Yeah. This is a powered volume pedal, so it's got a buffer in it. Okay. So because I go to the volume pedal first, the buffer kind of helps you not lose that top end. Yeah. Um, which has been really good. It's made by this company, Lele. I don't know how you pronounce that. Yeah. Um, they make little buffers and stuff that people that are pretty popular. Yeah, and they make, uh, they, they kind of first became popular making little switching boxes. That yeah, are yeah, they've yeah. got some cool stuff. Yeah. Um, which I don't do a lot of amp switching, but I've seen those. Um, so I, I bought this because I thought, I'm going to try it, and it feels enough like the Ernie Ball volume pub, which is the one I got used to using. Yeah. I tightened it down all the way so that it feels nice and firm. And uh, it's really been a great, great pedal for me because there's no string to wear out or bust, which yes. we've all done. I've got a closet yeah. full of them. Yeah. And um, I've replaced plenty of strings. Yes, yeah. You know, it's almost I not worth it. the time. Yeah. yeah. So this has been great for the for the buffer. And then after that, I like to hit the compressor, yeah. um, which is this uh, FX Engineering. Got to give props to the True Tone Lounge. <laughs> the only reason I know about this pedal is from your episode. Yeah, with John Leventhal. It's become famous, yeah. this episode. You've been yeah. telling me about how, yeah. how many people tell you, well, I watched the John Leventhal episode and I went and bought this compressor. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I thought it was, you know, pretty funny. But it's, it's a, yeah, but it's a great little box. Yeah, and I like, you'll see how simple my approach is in, in things, but I, I don't trust um, a lot of knobs, I don't like a lot of options. And so what I love yeah. about this compressor is it's like, well, there's comp and level. That's, yeah. that's my kind of pedal, you know? Because yeah. I already like the way my guitar and my amp sound, and I don't need it to color it too much. And I just like it, it's just enough to give you a little sustain, which I love, I'm always looking for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because I played a Les Paul for so long and it always felt like it had like days of sustain. But I like the comp for that. Um, and it, you know, it's a good to push the amp a little. Like in the studio, sometimes that'll be the dirt pedal. We'll just be hit it with that, and it yeah. kind of pushes the amp a little. Um, next, I'm using this RC booster, which is, you know, it's not really um, nothing new for guitar players, especially in yeah. Nashville. But yeah. I, what I love about it is its ability to. Um, it's a great first stage uh, gain yeah. uh, for like rhythm chords and stuff because it doesn't do the mid push thing like yeah. a tube screamer, which is so it gives you a second option besides just the mid thing. And I like that um, you can hit it a few different ways. Like you could hit it, you can turn the pedal way up and turn the gain down. So you're doing it like pushing the front end of the amp, or you can like back it up and actually use the gain in the pedal, which is actually sounds great. Yeah. And then what I use it for live, I've got some markings on here. Like for a telly, I might add a touch of bass. And for my Les Paul, I might just bring it back a touch to get it to right. speak a little. So I like it for like shaping my tone almost more than gain. Yeah. Um, so for live, I use it a lot as like a, an EQ pedal. Um, yeah. Can and you... in the studio, it's a great first like, hey, we need some rhythm, big rhythm chords on this chorus. That's the first pedal I hit. You know, just go for that. And it always seems to hit, do the job. It seems to like the matchless. So I've, I've, I've come, become accustomed to that. Yeah. Out of there, I'm going to this old full drive, which I've had for... My, basically my whole career, yeah. Um, which I actually stole off of Chris's pedal board. <laughs> he was, when I first started playing the band, for like one song a night, he would play electric. And he is just doesn't get into like amps and pedals and he doesn't know what's going on in my, he doesn't care. Yeah, It's just not his world. He's got other things that he's thinking about. So he had this pedal board and I loved uh, the full tone stuff. That was kind of the first boutique yeah, company, first, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I shouldn't say the first, but it was one of the first. Yeah. And so it was like one that I knew about. And I was like, man, this is cool. He's got a full tone pedal. I'm gonna... I was like, can I steal that off your board for this camp? He said, yeah, sure. And I never gave it back because yeah. I was so obsessed with the I love the pedal. And what I love about it is um, it's got a, it, got, it does that thing where it lets your guitar kind of signal come through. Right. Similar to the tube screamer. It because sounds, the mid range boost. Yeah. yeah. And, it doesn't feel too gainy, but it's just enough. And then the boost side really adds a lot of um, sustain. Yeah. Um, so if I had to play my whole, like I could literally go on tour with Chris and play the entire concert with just like that pedal and like a delay and I'd be happy. Like it, it's that versatile for me. You yeah. Know, like, Cause you got the yeah. boost and you got the overdrive. And then if I back off my volume pedal, I've got a clean tone. You just cleaned it I up. I got three stages all in one little, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's really become a, a big part of uh, live for me. It's become a big, a big part of my my sound. It's just 
that's home base, you know. If I have that in some sort of AC30 style amp, I'm like, okay, I can get pretty comfy. Um, after that, I'm going into usually a mod pedal. Sometimes it's this DD5 that XTS modded for me that's got like a tap tempo. Yeah. We were just on a tour that I was trying like a, um, uh, a mod thing. So this is a vibrato pedal, um, chorus, chorus vibrato pedal that Walrus Audio makes. And it's just really cool for like getting your signal to wiggle a little bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, which uh, I really enjoyed using. Um, sometimes that's a tremolo pedal. Like I had a Boss tremolo pedal on there for a while. That's just the old school Boss one. That's, yeah. I love the way that sounds. It's a really musical pedal. Um, so this is kind of a constantly rotating okay. slot, that's, which is why you can see that things are a little yeah, torn up. It looks, yeah, it looks like you uh, you kind of you haven't haven't you know settled on exactly what you want in there. But it's yeah, there's fun. a it's, few things that never yeah. change, and then there's a couple of slots that I'm constantly. Well, it's also fun to change things. Yeah, out, right. Too. Yeah, we we get. So, it's yeah. not that you get bored, but you you get interested in other things. Yeah. So, so tell us how. Because then, then you have three delay pedals and, and a verb pedal. Uh -huh. So tell us how you would use the three delay pedals differently. So you've got the old DD5, yep. that ex exact tone, put a, a tap tempo on the top. Right. You've got the the standard you know timeline, and then you've got the tap uh, memory man deluxe. Yeah. So, so I would, I mean, to to make it really simple, I would use this for uh, off the script, no click track. I just need to tap something in and go. Yeah. I love that for like a dotted eighth or, or quarter note delay. Yeah. And then one of my favorites in here is this um, reverse delay. Yeah, I'll put like a lot of repeats like way back like this. And um, then you can play like a bunch of kind of like texture stuff and it just goes forever and I just love the way it sounds. It's really beautiful. Um, so I use that for that. Um, this I use for really specific BPM. So a lot of our songs, I'll start the song. Uh, with the drums or keys or whatever, and so I don't have time to tap it in. It needs to be on the money, like yeah. right, right, up, right when we click in, you know. And so I've got all my like settings and BPMs kind of memorized for our tours. Yeah. And so, um, so I'm scrolling a lot in there, and um, I use that for a, like a digital and uh, sometimes tape or, or or bucket sound. But usually it's the digital. Lately, I've been using the tape sound a lot out of there. But it's just such a great pedal, and I've. I've gotten to know it yeah. really well. And you know, like with gear, it's like, especially live, it's like you just gotta have something you know and right. you trust, you know? And so it's like, there's a lot of pedals out there that do that same job really well, but I just have gotten to know this one so well that if Chris says, hey, I wanna throw in that song from the record that we haven't played in a year and I don't have a, I don't have a setting for it, I yeah. can quickly make a bank and I know how it's gonna perform, you know? Yeah. Um, and then lastly, this Memory Man I use for like, um, Typically, live, it's for long repeats. The wa I've, I've got the feedback set pretty high, and I like it for lots of washy sounds with like a little bit of warble. So my kind of general rule of delay is I like something that's really specific and like pointed, so that'd be the timeline. Yeah. And then I like something that's got like some movement to it, a little bit of mod, well, and that Memory Man does that job. Yeah. Well, let us hear the difference between the timeline yeah, and, the, sure. and the Memory Man, how you'd, how you'd use them. Yeah, so um, I would say, let's see. So this is a timeline. So you can hear the um, tape sound on that. So that's a song that we have um, at 73 BPM. And I've got a part that kind of um, moves around a little bit and I want it to like really sync up. So yeah. like we've got the this verse part um, that's like a... You can hear how it, I like how you can hear how it dances a little bit with the, yeah. and it's like you could tap that in, but I like just knowing that it's gonna be right on the money. So when I start doing the arpeggio stuff, it just fits and I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And then um, the difference in that would be, uh, so uh, if I'm playing the same song, I might do this one to quarters. Um, so that would sound like. So you can hear it's a longer delay. Right. And if you put them together, a lot of times I'll stack them so you hear this little. Yeah. So they start, boom. Yeah. Do, get it, do, get yeah. It, you know, kind of get that thing. So then um, if I start wanting to like make the sound kind of fill up, I might play those same parts um, together uh, or the same 
uh, sounds together and then change the part. So like that verse part was like this. Then we get to the chorus, I might open it up and it's. So it's just a way of, um, it's just a way of getting the, to manipulate the sounds, right? You're just constantly like, how do, does this chorus need less delay, more delay? Can I stack them? Can I? And it's nice for swells, this thing, because I, you know, at the end of a song, it's one thing to go like this at the end of a song. Like a lot of times we'll have like a down moment and then there'll kind of be this kind of big swell. And so if I'm just like dry, it's like, well, that's nice. But if I can do this, You have all this extra, you've got all this extra time for it to kind of, you know, and what I'll use this memory man for in those moments is a lot of times live, Chris, um, and you'll still be turning the reverb pedal on and off, but Chris will go back into a chorus. And so maybe we end the song really big and I've got my delays on and he might like do like a, uh, like a refrain kind of thing where he'll go back into the song. And so I'll use the volume pedal and all this stuff to kind of, um, Maybe I'm sitting up here with something kind of texture-wise, so I'll kind of use those delays like this. I just use it to kind of like create like a little music bed where I'm just kind of picking around and um, it works well for like a moment where it's, you know, it's not like a specific part, but he's leading a chorus and it's really like kind of a, a kind of a prayer moment or a worship moment that needs to be a little tender. Yeah. And those, that memory man and the verb and stuff, it really allows me to kind of have some space, you know, where you can hit less notes, but you get right. all this texture, you know. Um, so that's really kind of where those delays kind of come from. Um, so yeah, so getting one that's specific to a BPM and one that I can kind of tap in that has some like warbly stuff. Um, and then the verb you heard yeah. is a mod um, verb on this boss pedal. And that's just one that I've used for forever. I'm just so used to hearing it. The RV5. Yeah, RV5. And uh, I use it live to split my signal. So I come in mono here and then stereo, or sometimes I do the stereo delay thing, but right now I'm mono in here. And then stereo out to my amps. Uh, today we're just one amp, but um, so you can hear what it sounds like without it. Or on. Yeah. So it's got a nice long, and it's not too bright, and I just like the way it sounds. It's got this nice, and you and I keep it over here on my left side of my board, um, so I can constantly roll the yeah. effect level. And you saw me do With that here foot. too. Yeah. So like I'm blending how much memory man and how much verb I want all night. I'm yeah. constantly messing with my foot. It's like, this is more like banks that I use, and then I'm manipulating these live like all night yeah. for like how much I want. Do you have to wear shirt, certain shoes so that you, so that you <laughs> get good, good flip-flop good, good, good situation? Grip on the knobs. <laughs> to be honest, these are not very good yeah. for that. I, I, it's, you know, these are a little chunky, you know, if you got something, no. Uh, I've gotten pretty used to, I've seen some guys will replace them with like big knobs and yeah. it works better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's really for me, it's just like get like a good drive tone and then it's all about manipulating delays and verbs all night for me. That's kind of where I live. So tell us about this Les Paul. Yeah, so I, I love Les Pauls. It's one of the first kind of loves for me touring was playing a Les Paul. And um, for years I played a vintage one um, that I, lo I really liked. It was the only one I had and I just, yeah. you know, I replaced the pickups on it. I had like a 90s one that I loved the pickups in, but the neck broke. And then I had a 70s one that I didn't love the pickup, so I used the one from the 90s and the, anyway. So I kind of yeah. made this hybrid guitar, which I toured with for a long time. Um, but it was really heavy, and I just kind of always thought, man, maybe there's a better option, you know? It's like, it's it's pretty good, but I, there was this sound I had in my yeah. head that I wanted to get out of a Les Paul. And uh, a buddy of mine had tipped me off to the custom shop stuff that was happening um, here since, I guess, 2013 or so with uh, the Gibson uh, custom shop. And so I started like, doing some research and looking around, I played a bunch of different ones. 
And I was like, I'm going to go on this quest to find a great Les Paul. And I looked and I looked and I played and I played. And I finally ended up at Carter Vintage. They had a whole bunch of, um, of these custom shops. And this is a 2014. And I went back and forth with a handful of them. They were all great. Yeah. Uh, but I went back and forth with a handful of them. And I just kind of fell in love with this one. It was a 57 uh, reissue. Um, and it was a 2014. So they, had, I think they had changed something about the glue and the yeah. pickups and the, they rewrapped yeah. them the way that they did yeah. them, you know. I don't really know, but I, I love the way it sounded. It sounded really open and bright and it wasn't um, too honky. Yeah. And I just really fell in love with this guitar. I played it all day at Carter that day. Um, and I was like, man, I just love the way this plays. I can't put it down. And it had a lot of sustain. I love the way the frets feel on these old, it was a big chunky neck and I never really had a Les Paul, the big fat neck. And so I was like, oh, this is cool. So it kind of has become uh, one of my main touring guitars. I, I play this and the telly uh, a good bit throughout the night. And then in the studio, it was nice to have a Les Paul I could trust, you know, because I, I love yeah. that it was really well set up and I could I could play up high and it wasn't going to be like, the inton intonation wasn't going to be weird. and So it sounded like a vintage guitar, but it played like a new guitar, which was nice because sometimes the vintage stuff, it's like the tone is so good, but if it's not in tune, I can't use it on the record, you know? So, um, so this was like a, a kind of a good meet in the middle like sounds vintage but stays in tune <laughs> yeah it plays well yeah yeah the the shade of gold on that is really nice oh thanks and yeah the, uh, and the mahogany on the back's really pretty yeah it's really um yeah it's really nice and bright and open and it's it just the paf thing on this was really nice it just sounded it sounded like what i wanted the les paul to say as soon as i yeah. kind of started playing i was like man i love because i don't like les paul in the traditional like crunch rock way i like it in like the um I don't know, like the way like a lot of guys will use like their even their fingers on like a Les Paul style guitar, like a Daniel Lanois kind of thing. And it's yeah, like you get this yeah. kind of different tone. And I, I always love the way that kind of stuff sounded. I was like, man, I'd love to get like a, and that's a, a kind of a, a weird example because he's not like a traditional guitar player by any means. But I love the way that kind of stuff sounds. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and uh, so this this was, has become a good a good tool live, um, and it just sounds good. It's nice and it works well with the chimey amps and seems to really feel feel right for me and yeah it's been good i love this guitar uh, i'm using this uh a lot this is a, called a fano f-a-n-o and uh i got this guitar out of this guitar shop in um chattanooga called humbucker music Do you yeah. know humbucker? and i was in the studio uh with a guy who had a fano i'd never seen one i was like man that's the coolest guitar i've ever seen what is this he's like man if you go to their website and you look around, he's like, you're going to have to get one because they're like the coolest guitars. And so I went online. I started looking around. We were living in Atlanta at the time. And I was, I was like, man, I got to find a dealer. And there was one in Chattanooga. So I drove up and I played. They had like one that was like a Les Paul, one that was like a Tele, one that was like a Firebird. And then they had this thing, which was like, I don't even know what to call this. It's like a big yeah. Mustang. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of got a Strat bridge, but then it's got P90s. Yeah, like and it it's, comes and through the bottom. Some, like this yeah. feels like a Strat with yeah. the contour. Yeah, but then it's got kind of some Mustang and, and It's yeah. bizarre. It's yeah. the weirdest guitar. It's and, cool. And, and they've sanded off the back of the fretboard, which feels real comfy. Um, and it comes relic, but I've since, you know, really uh, played it a lot, as you can see. And um, it kind of became my number one guitar for like four or five years. I just played it on everything. I just, yeah. And what I liked about it um, was that it was different. It has these Fralin P90s in it. Uh, everything else on my guitars is pretty original to the guitar. Same with this. This, this is what it came with. It's like Fralin P90s. And um, I just liked it. It was like a little hot rod or something. I plugged yeah. it in and it was, it's a really loud guitar. So it pushes the amp really easily. And the pickups are kind of dark. So I almost have to push a little top end. Um, but it's, the neck almost sounds stratty mm -hmm. and then the middle position almost gets, it's, it's not the out of phase strat thing, but it's the closest thing I can get without having a five way switch. And it kind of has yeah. this weird, it's a really nice, I love the way these two pickups sound together. And then the back is like real raunchy sounding. So it's like a mm -hmm. good P90 kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of got used to this live. I just, I, I love the way that I love, uh, Rosewood fretboards and this one felt really good. And I've, I need to get it refretted. It's, I've used it so much. So I heard this interview, um, with, uh, I think it was Josh Smith was talking about playing guitar and he had he had some hybrid guitar that he played he's like well when I pick up a Strat I think about Jimi Hendrix and when I pick up a Les Paul I think about so and so and I pick up such a he's like but when I pick up this guitar I'm just me 
I don't think I'm not hmm. thinking about playing like anyone. Yeah. I'm not thinking about being a traditional Strat guy or Les Paul guy. And that's kind of the way I feel about this one. I didn't know that until they said that. And I was like, that's why I love that guitar. Because yeah. when I write a guitar part on this, I have no f- frame of reference. There's no one that I know that's like a famous Fano player that like, so it's kind of nice in my mind to have a clean slate. I pick it up and I'm like, well, P90s is not like unique to a certain guitar player. Right. And it doesn't have this natural like, oh, that's a Fender into a Fender. You know, it just, yeah. it's got its own thing. And so when I play it, especially for writing parts, I just go to a whole different headspace. And um, so that's been a good guitar for me to kind of feel like I can be myself and I don't really like, you know, I don't feel like, you know, sometimes you pick up a telly and you instantly want to, it's hard not to go into that country twang thing. Yeah, or, you know, the Keith Richards thing or the the James Burton thing or something like that. Yeah, the Keith Richards thing would be awesome. I would love to sound like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's... uh, yeah, so this is I like that because it's it 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 doesn't feel like anybody's thing, and yeah. I like that because when I when I pick it up, I just play like myself, I think, or at least in my brain, I, I'm not instantly trying to, to sound like. Yeah. Someone. You're not thinking about one of your heroes yeah. and trying to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I, it's been a good guitar for me in that way, and I love the anytime, like I said, because I'm the a lot of times the only guitarist. Anytime I can get a pickup that's nice and fat, it kind of helps me fill out some space, you yeah. know, without having to have another guy. So. Yeah. This one does that. <laughs> what uh, what strings and picks do you use? So I use, um, so Diodario, I've used their stuff for forever. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, I've always used their 11s. They're yeah. like the, um, oh gosh. What is 11 through 49 or Yes, 11 through 49. Yeah. The 115 pack or whatever. Yeah. And I've just bought those for years. I'm so comfy on them. And especially on a guitar, if you can tune down a half step, those 11s feel amazing. Like on yeah. this guitar, it's yeah. really... Uh, feels good. Sometimes on the telly, I wish maybe I, I could go down to a 10 or they do, oh, they do a string pack called a 10 and a half yes. through whatever. Yeah. I started using those. That's so cool. Cause yeah, it's, it's right in, in the middle. Yeah. For the telly, which is a little tighter, like the Les Paul and this seem to like 11. Sometimes the telly feels a little tight and that 10 and a half like makes that difference up. You know, yeah. it feels really uh, effortless, but you still feel fat down low on the, on the lower strings, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Diodario. And then Picks, I use these Dunlop ones. Um, I don't have an endorsement with them, but it's just, um, it's got this grip on it, which live I like because yeah. you don't drop the thing. Yeah. And um, and I like it for the uh, the scratch thing. So I'll spin this, I'll spin the pick around and I'll get, get some of the edge. Uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, raspy the, thing. You know, which yeah, he's famous for, thing. but it does help yeah. kind of get the part to stick through yeah. the mix a little bit. Yeah, it does. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just like the way I like the way it feels. You know, I know a lot of guys really go deep into the picks, the search for the right pick, and yeah. I don't know that um, I don't know if I'm like a good enough player <laughs> to like be a guy who's like, oh, I gotta have a fifty dollar guitar pick <laughs> for my tone. You know, like I don't. So for for me, it's like. I need a bunch of them because I'll drop them live. Yeah. And I, you know, it's like a really expensive guitar pick wouldn't make much sense. So this is, we, I've just gotten really comfy with these because I can hold the grips and I like the scratchy thing for those, for those high parts. Yeah. Um, and then on acoustic, I'll use the same pick, but a 0.73, a little lighter for the acoustic. Yeah. It's a little easier to strum and doesn't feel as bulky in the mix maybe or something live. So, so what are you up to next? Um, so I'm, we're kind of turning the corner. We just finished a live, um, live stream of our whole new record. So Chris, okay. uh, Chris just put out a record called Holy Roar that we, um, just wrapped up. We just released it and we did like a live stream. So we had to like learn all those brand new songs and play them live. Yeah. And we did like a live stream. It was really a cool thing. And, um, so that just finished. So now I'm kind of turning the page to Christmas cause we're about to do a Christmas tour. So I've got to go back in and relearn all my Christmas songs. Uh, which is fun because it's like, you know, it's like the one time a year I had to get to break up my like jazz chords and stuff that, um, you know, for me, it's totally I, it's something I have to memorize. It doesn't come naturally to me to, to be in the jazz world. So I, um, we have a few songs that are like that. Most of the songs we play for Christmas are kind of in keeping with the way our music sounds, but there's a few kind of jazzy things that I'm mm-hmm. like, oh man, I got to like really work on that. Um, so that's coming up at Christmas. And then um, next spring we'll do a big proper tour um, that uh, is called the is called Holy Roar with our pastor and a few other artists and um, it'll be a proper like as big as we as big as we can go. Everything will be 
up and on and loud and yeah. <laughs> well, Daniel, I really appreciate. Hey, you man, are you kidding this me? This is such home. an honor. That, yeah. That's really a privilege. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching the True Tone Lounge. Make sure and subscribe so you never miss an episode.